Good morning. I'm about ready to start another uh, recording of our book prison for the Prison Professors podcast, and I am recording this for a reason. Remember, our YouTube channel and our Facebook page serves a purpose. If you're going to build a digital business, you really want to put as much content out there as possible, and you want to be authentic. So one of the things that I strive to do is show people how do you build something like this? Because besides trying to help people prepare for a prison journey, I want to show them that you always have to be focused on, on being productive. You always have to be focused on your end game. And my end game is to build a business that serves as many people as possible in uh, and, and, and an ability to do it from home. And I like to show everybody all the different skills that you have to develop. So this is a recording I make for posterity to kind of memorialize the process. And the first thing that I have on here on the screen, which you can see, is a, um, a, a content schedule. I'm going to try and make it a little bit smaller so that you can see it all. So this is a content schedule that I've created, and it's the way that I manage my my content going all the way across. So so I've got a series of different a series of different uh, columns here that our team uses to record everything that we're doing. So we put the date that we're recording information, we put the site where it's going to be published, we put the purpose of this product that I'm recording, the title, and then the URL. As I develop a URL for something, I plug, I plug it in there. And that way I can use this feature. What I'm creating here are digital assets, right? This takes a lot of time to create, but these are assets. And these assets right now are are actually, I'm just getting a text from, from General Scott. Hi, I'm recording. <laughs> I'm recording. Um, uh, so I, I record, <laughs> send me link to Tripod Peace, reply, okay. <laughs> okay, after I finish, after, after I finish recording. Let me just do this in real time, after I finish recording. Okay, um, so anyway, I'm showing you how this works. So I create all these things for all of my different businesses. This content schedule specifically is only for my businesses related to or businesses that I have with my partner, Justin, where we are, we are recording businesses to help people understand the prison system and how to succeed through prison, how to prepare for prison. We want them to see that we're 100% authentic and real and we create everything that we do. And so this is a great tool for me to uh, record in real time how I'm gonna record this audiobook and it's free. You can get our audiobooks free just by visiting any of our websites, um, which is white, include White Collar Advice, Prison Professors, or Resilient Digital Public, no, resilientcourses.com. I have a lot of different of these ventures. So in any event, let's go to where I'm recording the audio file and I'm gonna open this template and I need to open this template because um, that is a wrong template. That is a template for InDesign, which is another product I need to use a lot. Um, this is a audio file. So I want to go back to the hard drive that I have. This is an audio file. I'm looking for this book. And I thought that I had a template here. Yeah, that's a template. That S S that S E S X tells me it is an audition template. That's the that's the uh, file name for audition. And audition is the audio recording platform that I use. So I'm going to open that. And when I open it, you've noticed I've already have a file open there, number seven. What about uh, the PSR? And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open that or the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually open the manuscript chapter and it's right here. So I've got the chapter written. So these are all the different skill sets that we have to have if we are going to build a digital venture. So I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. And as I did in previous chapters, I'll probably ad lib a lot of this, um, but I'm going to show you how I start. So this probably says chapter six, this is a template. So it probably says chapter six. Let's just see. Okay, so that says chapter five. So I'm going to eliminate that right now. I'm also going to save this as seven. This is seven and this is about, uh, what about PSR? Because I'm gonna be talking about the pre-sentence investigation report. So I'm gonna hit okay right there. And I'm going to part, start the scrubber and I'm going to insert just an introduction. So I'm gonna record that by just saying, uh, this chapter is going to be about, no, strike that. I'll show you how to edit this then. All right. 
what should I? No. I'm about to read chapter seven, and this will chapter will focus on the pre-sentence investigation report. Okay, there you go. So you notice that I, I said it a few times. I didn't like the way I said it the first time. I can open this file right here. I can move back to where I was. I'm going to delete. I'm going to cut the, this area right here because I know I don't like it. So I'm just going to use the razor tool, use the select tool, collect, cut that right there, bring this over. And that's what's going to follow my intro. So this like basically says an intro of what this book is about. This each one is a separate chapter. Each file is going to be a separate chapter that I will later publish on our website. So uh, uh, for podcasts. So if I go to prison professors podcast on iTunes, you will see it right here. It's on Google. There are uh, a series of um, previously recorded podcasts. And, and, and right now I just happen to be recording this book. So after I record this, I will load this into a separate file, which is this one, Libsyn. And I have an account here. And this is where I host my podcast. And then this feeds out to Stitcher and, and every place else. So this brings us attention. It's just a, a process that we use to bring our content out in every way possible, whether it is audio, video, print, every way possible. We want our audience to see that we are absolute experts in the field. We create our own content. We uh, teach. We never ask anybody to do anything that we're not doing. And so you're going to be able to hear me do it live right now. You can tune out if you'd like, or you can and, and, and subscribe on to our podcast on iTunes. We'd love it if you subscribed to our uh, YouTube channel. Um, and if you subscribe, that way you get notified when we publish new content and we publish a lot of new content. Um, to help people who are going into the prison system, if they're preparing for sentencing, if they're preparing for court, if they are trying to build a successful career after, um, all of this information is available through our content. And so we, we keep it in real time and uh, it's free if you get it this way. So hopefully hopefully you're, you're learning something from this. As I start to read chapter seven of our book, Prepare What Defendants Should Know Before Court, Sentencing, and Prison. Free book, download from White Collar Advice, prisonprofessors.com, or resilientcourses.com. Thanks. Okay. Sorry about that. Getting phone calls here. Um, I'm going to actually put this on to airplane mode so I don't get disturbed. Okay. So I'm going to have to cut this audio as I did before, before I start. So I'm going to let it go flat line. I'll clap. And then you could see as I clapped the, uh, those lines, those lines indicate I don't want this recorded for me when I later go back to edit. Okay. After a person pleads guilty or is found guilty, the pre-sentence investigation is going to be the next step. So if you want more details on this, I really encourage you to check out Rule 32 of the U.S. Rules of Criminal Procedure in the federal system. Now, every state system has a similar rule in their book of criminal procedure. And if a person has been charged with a crime, he really wants to get to know everything about the process because that way he can work more effectively with his attorney. So in federal cases, probation officers conduct these investigations to help sentencing judges and others evaluate the background of the person. Now, the investigation culminates with an all-important pre-sentence investigation report. And as I've said previously in an earlier chapter, the pre-sentence investigation report is sometimes referred to as the PSI, sometimes referred to as the PSR. It's the same document. Now, this report includes recommendation based on guidelines and the probation officer's opinion. It includes, and it's something that the sentencing judges are going to consider before they impose the sentence. So besides the importance of the PSR for sentencing, people should pay really close attention to the process because the report also plays a significant role in the person's life after he is sentenced, especially if he's sentenced to prison. Information in the PSR influences how authorities classify the individual before he goes to prison, when he will be released, what types of programs he can participate while he's in the prison, and what level of liberty he is going to have when his sentence concludes. So if, if those are factors that are important to somebody going into the system, we really highly recommend that you learn everything you possibly can about the pre-sentence investigation report before you go in. And our website at prisonprofessors.com provides a lot of that information for free. 
You just have to click on it. You have to invest your time and your energy to read. Or of course, you can watch our YouTube channel or our iTunes podcast and listen and learn that way as well. But to preserve the right, your rights, and to self-advocate once you're inside, it is crucial to understand everything about the PSR before it begins. So in our opinion, best practice preparations require you to invest time and energy so that you understand the process and so that you can influence the process. Now, if the defense attorney fails to stress the importance of the PSR, you've got to be wary of the type of legal counsel you're receiving. In prison, the PSR will be the main document that administrators are going to use when they're making assessments, especially at the start of the journey. Case managers are going to use it to document and consider the severity of the offense. They're going to use it uh, with regard to the pattern score, which is all important now in light of the First Step Act and opportunities to get earlier release from prison. Counselors are going to use this document to determine who can visit you while you're in prison. Educational administrators are going to use the PSR to determine whether you're required to participate in specific programs. Psychologists are going to use the PSR to determine whether a person is eligible for beneficial programs that can significantly influence the time that he serves or potentially a time reduction. Medical personnel will turn to the PSR to determine whether this uh, person merits uh, specific medical attention or whether he should be serving that sentence in an institution where there is more medical attention provider, med- opportunities for medical care provided, such as a federal medical center. Now, once the court accepts the PSR, it's going to follow the person all the way through his journey. And if there are errors in the PSR and the probation officer refuses to make those adjustments, then it's absolutely critical to ask the judge, to have your attorney ask the judge to address those errors in the statement of reasons, which I will discuss a little bit below. So let's talk about how the investigation begins. The probation officer that's assigned to the case is going to begin the investigation by becoming familiar with the government's version of the offense. Then the probation officer will schedule a face-to-face, and that meeting is going to take place either at the person's home, at the probation office, over the phone, or if the person's in custody, um, the probation officer will go to the prison and have that meeting there. Now, prior to the meeting, the probation officer is going to have insight on the case from the prosecutor and the investigators. The purpose of that meeting is to collect information from the person being investigated, if he's willing to offer it. So expect the probation officer to ask um, what a defendant has to say about the offense. He's also going to ask about uh, the person's background and among other, among other things, he's going to ask about family history, um, your educational experience, your what, what experiences or, or op- challenges you've faced with the criminal justice system in the past, what level of employment you've had. Um, they're going to ask a, a very important question about your history with substance abuse, they're going to ask about your medical condition, and they're going to look for, 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 for real details on your financial status. So anybody that's going through the PSR investigation should remember that probation officers are law enforcement officers. So if the probation officer believes that, that, that an individual has lied or provided misleading information, or if he believes that the defendant tried to influence others inappropriately, the probation officer may make things significantly worse for a person. And that means that he could charge the offender or suggest that the offender get charged with obstruction of justice, or he doesn't even have to charge him with an obstruction of justice. He could simply recommend a, a, an enhancement to the sentence because uh, he lied or, or the probation officer determines that he lied or in some kind of way obstructed the or impeded the investigation in some kind of way. So it's really important when you're going into this pre-sentence investigation report that you know you don't have to say anything, but if you are going to say something, don't lie. That's, that's a, a general rule whenever you speak with any law enforcement officer. You don't have to speak to them, but if you do speak to them, don't lie. Now, probation officers have huge caseloads, and it may feel as if they're cynical. The investigator is going to interview the offender's family members. He's going to check the offender's school records. He's going to try to understand the official records of your previous legal problems. And he's really looking for information to verify um, everything that you've said, including your medical condition and anything else. 
Now, a person can reserve his right to remain silent during the investigation, as I said, but if he chooses to communicate, he's got, we, I can't emphasize enough the importance of being honest because a, a probation officer can very easily uh, take something that you have said and turn it against you in such a way that can result in, in an enhancement to your sentence for obstruction of justice. Now, some people refuse to provide any information at all to the probation officer. They may have valid reasons for wanting to remain silent, but if he doesn't part, but if a person doesn't participate in the investigation, the probation officer, you got to know what's going to come. He's only going to write the government's version of events, and that's something to consider because you want to be able to advocate for yourself. If you don't know how to do that, highly recommend that you talk with people who've gone through the process and you learn about the process. Learn about what you can do to influence this very important document. Now, the appellate strategy may influence a person's you know, decision of whether to participate. He may choose not to answer questions about the offense. But if that's the case, my recommendation is that you should still be courteous, explaining that for appellate reasons, your lawyers advise you not to discuss any aspects of the case. You, know, you may want to cooperate with the investigation in ways that won't jeopardize your rights. And we recommend that unless you have a good reason you ought to cooperate with this investigation. In fact, we urge people to prepare a sentence mitigation strategy long before that PSR interview and provide as much documentation as possible to the probation officer so that PSR report is seeded with the information that you have planted there. By giving the, the probation officer this personal narrative, that you are making the probation officer's job much easier. He's frequently going to cut and paste entire paragraphs into the report. And this strategy will influence a document that's going to prove enormously influential while the person is serving a sentence, particularly now in light of the First Step Act. And I'll provide some, some, some examples. I'm going to go off script a little bit here and talk about where we are uh, today. So I'm recording this episode on, on April, the April the 16th. I think today is Thursday. And I'm recording this, op this, this uh, podcast and this video when we're in the, you know, we're really in the midst of a pandemic. And it's put the Federal Bureau of Prisons into a crisis where the Attorney General has mandated the Director of Prisons to send as many people home to home confinement from prison as possible. And that means a lot of people that, that haven't even served half of their sentence are being considered for early termination of their time in prison and, and they are serving the rest of the time on home confinement. Do you know what's influencing that decision? The pre-sentence investigation report. So if you understand how to influence that report, you're going to put yourself in a much stronger position much later down the, down the path when you don't have an attorney present. So once you're inside the prison, a unit team member is going to meet with a with person and and administrators are going to be the case managers and the counselors. And the only thing they're going to look at is that pre-sentence investigation report. You will not have an attorney with you at those meetings, but they are going to rely on what's in that PSR report. And for that reason, before going inside, we really recommend that you invest time to understand this document. And that's what we're going to talk about in the rest of this podcast. Because the probation officer's recommendation is not binding on the judge, but it's extremely influential. It's, it's, and it's even more influential when a person gets into the prison system because it's going to follow you for a long time. So let's talk about what does the pre-sentence investigation report look like. You can get a sample of it on our website, but it looks like, uh, I'm, it looks like you've got these different categories, and one of them is offense conduct. And in this section, the PSR is going to write the government's version of events. They're going to write a victim's impact statement meaning if there has been an identifiable victim in the case and that person is, uh, uh, chooses to speak with a probation officer, they're going to write that victim's statement in there. And it's going to follow you for the rest of your time you're exposed to the criminal justice system. Then the probation officer is going to write about the defendant's participation in the crime. So that's, that's relevant when there are multiple defendants and you really want to be clear there of what your level of culpability is. Because a probation officer could, 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 could attribute criminal behavior to you that may, that may not have, you may not have had anything to do with. And I've got plenty of examples of people who have fallen into trouble because of that. I mean, I had a, uh, 
a, a, a colleague, or I don't know what you want to call it, but somebody that worked with our team and he was just a mortgage broker. And as a mortgage broker, he was in the business of helping people get loans. And one of the people that he helped get loans for was an, an organized crime figure. And the, you know, he was just in the business of getting loans. He wasn't a member of an organized crime family in New York, but because of the nature of the crime that it included many figures from organized crime, the probation officer really emphasized that in the PSR. And then when that guy went to prison, the case managers didn't really look at the indictment. They looked at the conviction, but the PSR is what they made their judgments on. They gave him a what's called a public safety factor, alleging that although he wasn't convicted of organized crime, he was just convicted of a white collar crime, uh, a white collar crime that involved mortgages. Uh, he had a public safety factor put on him that required more security because they said that he was affiliated with organized crime. Well, it resulted in him serving a sentence in a much higher security institution. And that is, that is a problem because if, if today, uh, as a result of that public safety factor, he would not be as good of a candidate to being released on home confinement like many other people are. So you really want to understand all of these things. You really want to do your part to influence the public sa the, the pre-sentence investigation report. And we really encourage you to speak with people who have extensive experience in this, in the, in this, this level of proceeding. The problem with attorneys is that attorneys really don't place as much emphasis on the PSR because they know that the judge uh, ha has already paid a lot of attention at sentencing and the attorney is going to uh, fancy himself as the expert at sentencing and, and he very well may be fighting valiantly and courageously for a lenient sentence. But remember, after the, the lawyer goes away, when a sentence is imposed, you know, generally that's the end of the relationship that terminates the relationship between the client and the attorney. The client goes into the prison system. He no longer has an attorney, but he's going to have that lingering pre-sentence investigation report that an attorney may not have thought was very relevant for sentencing. It's going to be relevant to the defendant once he's in prison, but at that point, it's too late to influence it. So highly, again, recommend you learn about it. Also, uh, the, the pre-sentence investigation report is going to have this question about obstruction of justice. That's what we, I was speaking about earlier, that if you lie or if the probation officer alleges that you lied or you're less than truthful or you tried to influence it in some kind of way, he is going to write uh, some you know, negative comments there that are going to hurt you in prison and potentially at sentencing. And then there is this sentence of acceptance of responsibility. As you likely know from earlier uh, podcasts and, and, and our work earlier, if you downloaded the book, um, there's a possibility to get a, down, a, 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 a few extra points in the federal sentencing guidelines for acceptance of responsibility. Um, and in this section here, it's going to de the probation officer is going to recommend whether you qualify for two or three points under acceptance of responsibility. Again, this isn't binding, but it is a guideline and it is something you want to think about. Then there's going to be a rather extensive uh, comput com com uh, computation of the federal sentencing guidelines that incorporates offense level. Um, I've got a lot of sections on the federal sentencing guidelines that you can check out on prison professors.com for free. Just check the above button. I think it's called sentencing and there's a whole series of, of, of articles on the sentencing guidelines. There's going to be a section on criminal history. All of these go into a matrix, by the way, that provide a, a sentencing range. So the, these, are, these are static factors. There's nothing you can do about it. Every crime has a a uh, guideline associated with it. If it's a white collar crime, like wire fraud, mail fraud, securities fraud, tax evasion, um, those types of crimes, they're gonna have an amount of loss attributed to it. A lot of times that amount of loss is, has nothing to do with how much you gained, but rather what the probation officer is assessing, um, how much defendants could have lost from this crime. And that's going to influence the sentence length. So you want to understand that. You want to try and influence that. You want to try and bring clarity to that. Your criminal history, again, a static factor. Nothing you can do about the past. Uh, offender characteristics. Um, this is going to be where the probation officer writes a little bit about what you've done and why we believe it's really important to have an effective sentence mitigation strategy, hopefully one that you have engineered and engineered well. Um, there's going to be a section there about substance abuse, and it's going to ask uh, a person whether he has any history of substance abuse. 
And our experience is that a lot of people, uh, when they're going through this process, they don't want to reveal that they had a problem with substance abuse or had any issues of substance abuse because they think it's going to hurt them. Uh, in fact, the opposite is true. If you, if you don't have, if you don't reveal that you've had a substance abuse problem, you are going to uh, disqualify yourself from being able to participate in one of the most beneficial programs in the Bureau of Prisons, and that's the residential drug abuse program that can potentially qualify you for up to a year off of your sentence. A lot of times people go to prison and they learn about RDAP while they're in prison and their documentation shows that they don't qualify. So there are some rather elaborate steps to qualify. It's important to learn about those steps because it can cost you a year in prison if you uh, make the mistake of not revealing your substance abuse history prior to going in. So physical condition, um, here the probation officer is going to talk about your health. And you've got to be able to document this record if you have some type of health problems because it's going to influence uh, where you sleep and potentially where you serve your time and potentially when you get out of prison. That's certainly the case right now for people in the COVID-19 pandemic where the government is uh, giving an opportunity to people to go serve the rest of their time on home confinement. They've got to have their medical history documented. Educational and VT skills is another important area. You may want to talk about what your educational background is because it could qualify you for specific jobs while you're in prison. Um, again, everybody in prison, that's what they are going to turn to as a first sign of information, and your PSR, and so you want to document it. If you've got specific skills, you might want to talk about them here. At the, on the flip side, um, it can hurt you. If you've got a crime of um, some type of computer hacking or breaking into data systems or things of that sort, uh, Bureau of Prisons administrators can use that against you with regard to your access to telephone or your access to computers um, or your access to specific jobs. So you, you're going to want to, again, understand the PSR and that way you can influence this section to your favor. Um, the only way, I, there's, it's so broad I can't even go into it all here because it's, it's, it's individual specific. Uh, if you've got a specific type of crime, you're going to want to um, influence this document in such a way or understand how this document and what the probation officer writes is going to influence your job aspects in prison. Uh, employment record, where have you worked? The probation officer is going to talk about that. Your financial condition, this is an important uh, element here. You can't lie on it because if you lie on it, you're actually committing another crime. Um, they're going to require you, the probation officer is going to require you to submit financial data. And if you submit that financial data, you are doing so under the uh, potential penalty of perjury. So you've got to reveal all of your, your accounts, your financial status. And that's going to potentially influence the type of the type of uh, sentence you receive or sanction you receive because the judge may impose a significant restitution order or a significant fine. Um, or he can even impose what's called the cost of incarceration fee and charge you for your own imprisonment. So understand these different metrics and then understand what you can do to mitigate and position yourself for success. So it's probably worthwhile for you to invest the time and the energy to really understand the PSR either by reading, listening, watching, retaining somebody to help you. I would not, uh, I would recommend that you speak with somebody other than an than attorney because the attorney is not going to know how this document is going to influence you inside of prison. Um, your sentencing options here, the probation officer is going to talk about what options are available if potentially you're, you're eligible for an alternative sanction. Um, such as home confinement or some type of diversion program where a person could uh, do some type of community service rather than going to prison. Um, these are at, these are, this is the area where that would be revealed in your probation report. Again, that's going to have a lot to do with your mitigation strategy. There are going to be some things that you can't really change. Um, you know, you can't change the fact that of, of what you pleaded guilty to or what you were found guilty of. And you, but what you do have to be doing is understand what can I do to influence both sentencing and what can I do to mitigate the way that the Bureau of Prisons is going to treat me once I go inside of the system. So what are the factors that warrant departure? Well, in the federal system, there are, there are many sentencing factors 
that can influence either an upward departure or a downward departure. Um, a mitigation strategy will help you on the downward side. On the upward side is going to a lot is going to have to do with how you um, c conducted yourself throughout the proceedings. Um, if the probation officer or the or the prosecutor allege that the the crime to which you pleaded guilty doesn't accurately reflect your criminal liability, they may ask for an upward departure. And I, I again, I think that this is more uh, this influencing this or, or, or lessening the prospects of getting an upward departure has a lot to do with a person's understanding of the system and understanding of where does he stand in this and what can he do to make things better. The earlier a person has answers to those questions, the better he can, he can position himself for a successful outcome. That's one of the reasons that we produce so much content in so many different kinds of ways. We really want people to understand before they go into the system. Now, the final uh, section here that I wanted to cover in this particular podcast is the statement of reasons. A lot of people don't understand the statement of reasons, but it is one of the documents that the judge is going to conclude at the end of these proceedings. So the, the, one of them is going to be uh, a PSR is going to be hugely influential, as I described, through the prison sentence. Then, of course, the sentencing date is going to be very important, and that's going to be recorded on the uh, judgment order. And that judgment order is going to be delivered to the, the, the U.S. Marshals, and they're going to send it to the Bureau of Prisons. And that judgment order is going to include the actual sentence length, the, the monetary sanction, if you have one, and also the conditions of release that a probation officer will eventually turn to. But then there's another document called a statement of reasons. So, in, 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 and I'll just go to turning back to reading from the book right now. In, the, in addition to the pre-sentence investigation report, the court will submit a statement of reasons to the Bureau of Prisons, and that's codified at Title 28, United States Code 994W1B. And I'm going to read exactly what it tells us. It says, the written statement of reasons for the sentence imposed, which shall include the reason for any departure from the otherwise applicable guideline range, and which shall be stated on the written statement of reasons form issued by the Judicial Conference and approved by the United States Sentencing Commission. And then I provide some inf more information in the book here. In February of 2016, the Judicial Conference issued and the Sentencing Commission approved Form AE245B. Section IB4 of the revised form tells us that, quotation marks, Comments or factual findings concerning any information in the pre-sentence report, including information that the Federal Bureau of Prisons may rely on when it makes inmate classifications, designation, or programming decisions. The United States Commission Sentencing Commission published a video um, at the following location, and I provide that video. Um, you can get it on our website, or uh, if you're only listening to this on iTunes, I encourage you to visit our website or download the free book so that you can actually watch the video. And this is really crucial, particularly for people who did not document their uh, substance abuse history, um, because this, pre this statement of reasons actually trumps the pre-sentence investigation report. If you, um, if, I mean, that, there's the quote, comments or factual findings concerning any information in the PSR, including information that the Federal Bureau of Prisons may rely on when it makes inmate classifications, designation, or programming decisions. If you can get, if you didn't document it in the PSR, but you've learned about, hey, this is an important program I want to participate in. You can get your lawyer to advocate for you or you can advocate for yourself to get it stated in the statement of reasons why you want to participate in this program and why you're worthy and qualified to participate in this program. That will significantly ease your journey and could potentially bring you home from prison a lot earlier. So the Bureau of Prisons is mandated to review both the Statement of Reasons and the PSR when classifying a person that's going to prison. So again, for that reason, we encourage attorneys to really make a strong case to persuade the judge to put specific language in the Statement of Reasons that may help a person qualify for specific programs. And if the judge can find that you have a minimum pattern score of recidivating, you want to try and get that into the Statement of Reasons because it will significantly influence the jury in prison. And that concludes chapter seven of our book, Prepare What Defendants Should Know Before Going to Court, uh, Sentencing, or Prison. And we encourage you to visit our websites at either whitecolloradvice.com, prisonprofessors.com, 
uh, resilient digital resilient courses.com are, you know, we've got my partner, and I, Justin McPerny, we operate three different brands, uh, for specific reasons. White collar advice is really our premier brand where you get to work directly with Justin and, and get your questions answered or, or members of his team. Um, and that's one-on-one, -on -one, uh, consulting to help you through various aspects of the system that tends to come at a higher cost because you can't scale that. It's just, it's every day, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's structured coaching, but it's specific and it's one-on-one. -on -one. And Prism Professors, I produce, as you can see, a lot of content for free that anybody can l rely upon to learn, um, but it's not one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not asking you your specific questions and so on and so forth. At Resilient Digital Publish, at ResilientCourses.com, we have digital courses that people can download and work on their own. It's a lot less expensive than one-on-one -on -one consulting, um, but it can still be helpful for somebody who's trying to structure a sentence mitigation strategy or prepare a, for a PSR or prepare for sentencing and things of that sort. So we've got a lot of information trying to help people in every way that we possibly can. We do ask that you subscribe to our, our programs. And, 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 if you, and if it's possible, we'd really appreciate it if you find value in them to leave us an honest review, either on our Facebook page at Being Resilient, that is our Facebook page for, for these programs, or on our YouTube channel, um, at subscribe. And I don't know if there's possibilities to leave comments or reviews. We try to be as responsive as we possibly can. And then finally, on our Facebook, uh, what, where else? Resilient, Prism. Uh, oh, on iTunes, on our podcasts. Yeah, I'd love it if you'd subscribe to our podcast. Subscribe, you can get this information when you're driving or, or any place else. Again, um, I'm Michael Santos, together with my partner, Justin Paperni. We want to thank you for being a part of our community. Thanks.